Emergency officials track the source of mysterious odors. Backers of a new youth center face financial hurdles. And frustrations mount as the search for a missing airliner continues. Good evening and thank you for joining us. Well, we now have an answer to what caused that terrible smell that hovered over a large part of the city today. It turns out that the Resolute Pulp and Paper Mill had an equipment malfunction, which led to the discharge of thick gases for about 20 minutes. The unpleasant odor had residents on both sides of the city worried about a possible natural gas leak. Phil Darlington has more. As many people around the city may have noticed, some foul gases from the Resolute Pulp and Paper Mill dissipated into the atmosphere early in the morning. The unplanned venting occurred after one of the mill's power boilers went offline. The two um, incidents that occurred earlier this morning were as a result of a computer um, glitch where the communication between the equipment and the computer went aw awry and um, that's now been corrected and the, the second, or I'm sorry, the third event was as a result of a failure of a valve and that valve has been corrected. It's something that would had happened once previously in February, people in the community might remember uh, that had already happened at one point, um, but uh, we resolved the issue today, um, this morning and, and brought the boiler back online and, and so the, the smell shouldn't continue. Many Thunder Bay residents smelt it and as it turns out, it was the mill that dealt it. But the sulfurous smell that came from the mill, as it turns out, was reported correctly to the ministry. In this case, um, the company does have reporting requirements that are written right into their approval. And any type of environmental incident, whether it's a discharge to the air or spill to the ground, they are required to report it immediately to the Spills Action Center. And they did that, so they, you know, that, that requirement has been checked off. Union gas officials and other local fire crews received numerous calls about the smell. And as it turns out, there was actually a small natural gas release at around the same time from a broken pipe being repaired on Fairbank Place just off of Junot Avenue. But Union Gas officials insist that the smell would only be noticed in the immediate area. That leaves the mill to blame for the bad smell in other parts of the city. The ministry says the chemicals that were vented cannot cause any health problems. There is no exceedance. Unfortunately, you still get that that unpleasant odor, but there's actually no real risk to the environment from those levels. The actual gases that were vented are comprised of sulfides and methyl mercaptan, which do resemble the odor associated with natural gas. Phil Darlington, TBT News. Mayor Keith Hobbs says he is not optimistic about the funding falling into place for the proposed new youth centre at the Port Arthur Pras Vita. The clock is ticking on a decision to proceed with the project as a hold on the building is set to expire. The head of the Indian Friendship Centre believes the city should purchase the facility and then continue to pursue funding from higher levels of government. Dennis Ward has the latest. Plans for a youth centre at the Port Arthur Pras Vita started to shift gears following the Good Roads Conference last month. When the local delegation returned, they didn't like the prospects of receiving funding from senior levels of government. It's not looking good uh, from the perspective of getting provincial and federal dollars. And are you willing to, uh, to go it alone? No, not me. Not, not me personally. Um, I'd have to ask council about that. The $10 million project put forward by the Indian Friendship Centre has already been scaled back from three phases to two, and there is talk of downsizing again. The city put up $57,000 last September to hold the building until the end of this month. The head of the IFC, Perhaps Bernice Dubeck, did not want to appear on camera, but feels the city should buy the Pras Vita. She says the youth centre is a priority, and together they should move ahead with the first phase of the project. The mayor says it may be time to start looking at a plan B. One option could include looking at existing community centres. I never floated that idea by um, our city manager that maybe that's the way to go. Maybe we team up with um, community centres and see if they can put a youth component in uh, into different neighbourhoods. Council will meet behind closed doors March 25th to discuss the proposed youth centre and more specifically this building's role in it. While the mayor is limited in what he can say about that, he does believe it's safe to say timelines for the youth center project have been pushed back. Dennis Ward, TBT News. There has been yet another delay in opening the new Marriott Town Place Suites here in Thunder Bay. 
The hotel had previously announced plans to open its doors tomorrow, but now reservations aren't being accepted for any dates before May 16th. The five-story, 148-room hotel is being built along the Harbour Expressway. It was originally supposed to open before Christmas, but things were put on hold due to problems with the concrete subfloors. The city's chief building official says the concrete on several floors began to shrink, crack, and even had holes punched through it. The hotel came up with an acceptable solution to reinforce the floors on all upper levels using steel and plywood. Hotel General Manager Derek Jones says they're continuing to carry out that work, but with more than 100 rooms to repair and refinish, it's taking longer than expected. He says they hope to have the work complete and their occupancy permit approved by mid-April, and then to open their doors soon after that. The city of Thunder Bay is falling back to the middle of the pack when it comes to the best places to live in Canada. That's according to the latest rankings by Money Sense. The city has been all over the map in recent years in the annual listings, but this is the first time we've fallen out of the top 100. Between 2007 and 2011, Thunder Bay was a city on the rise, topping out at number 20, according to the magazine. But we've been steadily dropping since then, and this year we've fallen to 109th place out of 201 Canadian communities. But those figures don't mean much to Mayor Keith Hobbs, who has found many errors in the numbers. I'm getting sick and tired of these reports that are coming out, and uh, find, I'm finding figures are totally wrong and uh, misplaced. Uh, for example, they have us at 8.4% unemployment. Uh, latest unemployment stats show us at 5.7%, almost 2% below the provincial average and the lowest unemployment rate in Ontario. Hobbs says similar to the recent Chamber of Commerce report, he's not giving the Money Sense report any credibility. The rankings are based on factors such as average income, property taxes, climate and local crime rates. The Thunder Bay murder trial is set to get underway next week at the Superior Court of Justice. 35-year-old Kesley Jacob from Summer Beaver First Nation is facing a charge of second-degree murder in connection with the death of 53-year-old Barney Beaver from Webequay. Beaver died in hospital one week after a violent incident in a room at the Victoria Inn on December 17th of 2011. Jacob was originally charged with aggravated assault. That charge was upgraded to murder after the victim succumbed to his injuries. City police have previously said the two men knew each other and that alcohol was a factor in the incident. Jacob's lawyer, Joseph George, or excuse me, George Joseph, and the lawyer for the Crown took part in a pretrial conference today to discuss jury selection. A trial scheduled to get underway on Monday. It looks like that warm weather we had on Monday was just a temporary break from this cold winter we've had. But the return to cool temperatures is actually good news for preventing flooding, according to officials with the Lakehead Region Conservation Authority. On Monday, the mercury reached 9 degrees Celsius. The situation caused large puddles around the city. And with all that snow we've accumulated this year, many people have expressed concerns about a potential spring flood. Now that we're back into negative temperatures, that threat has subsided. LRCA Chair Bill Bartley says it's still a little early to tell what will happen in the spring. At the present moment, though, he isn't concerned about flooding, but says things could change. If we got uh, heavy rain and we got uh, really warm weather and the snow melted really quickly, you know, because you know the rivers are still frozen, you know, 91 percent of the Great Lakes are still frozen out there, so that uh, that would, you know, it would be a problem. But at the present time, we're we're not anticipating that. Bartley says the higher levels of snow will raise lake water levels and help with shipping on the Great Lakes. It will also help people in the country with wells. He says they are monitoring the snow melt and will keep the public informed if anything changes. Thunder Bay Film Buffs will be able to indulge in some high quality cinema over the last two Sundays of March. The 21st annual Northwest Film Fest is being held at the Silver City Movie Theater. The North of Superior Film Association is hosting the event and there are some top films coming to the city. Among them are Oscar nominated Nebraska, Inside Llewellyn Davis and Philomena. And for fans of Thunder Bay actor Kevin Durand, his highly acclaimed movie Fruitvale Station is also on the bill. NAFSA President Marty Maskerin says he's excited to see the turnout and reaction from the local moviegoers, especially with the local talent that's being showcased in this year's fest. Screening uh, four films by uh, local filmmakers. It's something we've been doing uh, the last few years as a means to showcase local cinematic talent. And uh, these films will be screened as a preamble to each of the 7 o'clock screenings during the Sundays. We have two theaters, so that will, will be a, a total of four screenings. 
and uh, Red Light, by uh, written by Ryan Lavia, is one of our, our, our volunteers here. Uh, it was a fabulous film. It's a great annual event for the city because what they do is they bring in pictures that don't typically come to the big uh, multiplexes. Um, it expands people's view on different types of cinema from all over the world, not just from Hollywood. Um, and it's a great experience uh, for those who have never been to a film festival to come to this one because it is very friendly. Um, and they do choose uh, pictures that uh, will both enlighten and entertain an audience no matter what your taste and genre. The Northwest Film Fest runs March 22nd and March 29th, and advanced festival passes are available from NASA members or from the UPS store. Well, this was the final day of auditions in the So You Think You've Got Talent contest at Inner City Shopping Centre, and the competition is stiff as the contestants, young and old, were making it tough on the judges to pick their 15 finalists. Yesterday, the auditions brought 45 participants, and day two attracted even more. The 7th Annual March Break event features five categories for the various age groups, from under 10 all the way to adults and musical groups. People with any kind of talent can enter, but singing was definitely the talent favorite. Some of the participants spoke about why they joined and chose to sing for the judges. One, and for the prize, you know, just to win and just for something fun to do. I'm just in it for the fun, really. <laughs> I don't mind how, if I make it or anything. So. I just think um, the song makes me really happy, so I try to make everyone happy, feel the same way. I've never sat here once and not been surprised year after year. We've had everything from jokes to yo-yos, but the singing this year, um, the singing is kind of taking over, and I, I'm so impressed. The finals go tomorrow evening at 6 o'clock. The winner in each category will be going home with $200 in inner city gift cards and a $200 scholarship from Bounce Productions. And if you haven't done so already, you may want to check your ticket from last night's Lotto 649 draw. That's because buyers in Thunder Bay hold the winning ticket for not just one, but two major prizes. Ontario Lottery and Gaming says one of their guaranteed million dollar prize tickets was sold in our city as well, a $100,000 Encore winner was also sold here. Good luck if you hold a ticket. Uh, let's turn to weather now. Uh, we had a ticket. Oh, no, <laughs> I didn't. Not. I, I should have, but I didn't. Uh, Weather-wise, uh, not a bad day out there. We're still winning some snow, right, Kasia? That's right. We did have a pretty nice day today. Um, a low pressure system coming headed for us is going to bring us that snow and we're going to have a variety of ups and downs this weekend. So it's not really the weekend we were hoping for. But today we saw a bit of light flurries uh, starting through the day. It's between 7 and 9 a.m. And then as they tapered off, clouds moved in, giving us mostly cloudy skies throughout the day. And we got a few touches of sun here and there, but mostly cloudy. Um, with the wind chill starting at minus 16 as the day progressed, it averaged out to about minus 7 and a daytime high of minus one and uh, winds were pretty moderate and uh, averaging about 10 kilometers an hour. Currently in the region we are sitting at on the freezing mark so that's our new daytime high. Uh, mainly pluses on the west side of our region. Uh, Dryden and Kenora had mainly sunny skies throughout the day. Uh, same with Fort Francis it was sitting at plus eight. Um, Sioux, Saint Mer uh, Sioux look at sorry is at plus three. Uh, Pickle Lake has some cloudy skies and there was mainly uh, light snow for Greenstone throughout the day. It just tapered off with a temperature right now of minus six and it seems like that light snow uh, shifted over to Sioux St. Marie where they just started to get that snow and the same temperature of minus six. Uh, for tonight is when we're going to get that low pressure system headed for us. It will bring quite a bit of snow, uh, about five centimeters of just for tonight and the wind chill of minus 13. Uh, low of minus three and that precipitation will uh, continue into tomorrow. We could get a possibility of freezing rain as well tonight, so it might be a pretty messy start to the morning tomorrow. We're going to get an additional two centimeters because of that low pressure system there and you can see it's followed by a cold front. So our temperatures will drop pretty rapidly on Saturday, but I'll have uh, more details for you later on in the news hour. All right, thanks very much, Kasia. Well, it's been almost a full week now since the disappearance of that Malaysian Airlines jetliner, and we are still no closer to finding out what happened to the ill-fated flight. Details on that story and more coming up as your news hour continues. It has been days without answers for the families of the missing passengers of flight MH370.
Speculation about that Malaysian jetliner that went missing last weekend continues to grow. It's been almost a week since its disappearance. Very little can be confirmed as families of the 239 people on board wait and watch the broadening search. But what is certain is that frustration is growing, even as some optimism remains. Andrew Lee has the latest. It has been days without answers for the families of the missing passengers of flight MH370. My husband was on that plane. My child is asking me for dad day after day. What can I do? There's no information at all. We are really helpless. We need the government to support us. China's Premier Li Keqiang said today that as long as there's a glimmer of hope, they won't give up the search and are pressuring others to do more. The Chinese government has asked relevant parties to enhance coordination, Li says. Investigate the cause, locate the missing Malaysian Airlines plane and properly handle all related matters. It's the sixth day of looking for the 777. So far, not one piece of the plane has turned up. Not a seat, life vest or a piece of fuselage. Nothing. A multinational force is now searching from the South China Sea all the way to the Indian Ocean. A dozen militaries have committed to the quest to find this flight. To give you an idea of the scope of the search, India was the most recent country asked to help out. There is no real precedent for a situation like this. The plane vanished. We have extended the search area because it is our duty to follow every lead. Chinese satellite images of possible debris near the original flight path are being investigated. So far, nothing has turned up. A Malaysian surveillance plane was dispatched this morning to investigate potential debris shown on Chinese satellite images. We deployed our assets but found nothing. China is sending a ship to the area to follow up. As the sixth day of searching wraps up, the mystery deepens, yet hope exists. On a building in Shanghai written in Chinese was this message, MH370, we are waiting for you. Come back home. Andrew Lee, CBC News, Beijing. In New York City, rescuers continue to comb through the rubble of yesterday's explosion that leveled two apartment buildings. Earlier today, the city's mayor praised the efforts of first responders. The city is no stranger to adversity, and our first responders exemplify what's best about New York City, that we somehow persevere despite everything thrown at us. Overnight, emergency crews pulled out four more bodies. So far, seven people are confirmed dead in the explosion. About 60 others were injured. It's believed a gas leak triggered the blast. Today at the UN, Ukraine's new prime minister accused Russia of aggression. The Ukrainian peninsula of Crimea remains cut off. Ukrainian bases surrounded or occupied. Its ships locked in port. Susan Ormiston went aboard one ship to find a crew at the ready with few options. Good day. <laughs> Hello. Hello. Spasiba, thank you. The Ukrainian commander's fleet of naval vessels is marooned. When the Russian Navy came, they cut off access to the Black Sea. So, over 400 Ukrainian sailors and officers are on guard but can't pull anchor, except to drift a few hundred meters. And Russian snipers are watching them from the hill. Morale is high here, says Commander Vagensev, despite the fact no one knows when an order will come to open fire from one side or the other. Will you fight? If I'm ordered to fight, we'll be ready. That order likely won't come. For all the talk about defending Crimea, the Ukrainian military has not mobilized inside Crimea and, says the interim president, it won't. The 5th Brigade has been blockaded for nearly two weeks. Again, without a shot being fired, the Russians have effectively neutralized Ukraine's second most important naval base on the Black Sea. The sailors here can only wait. There is a semblance of a normal roster every day. Rotating the watch, maintaining the weapons, lunch in the wardroom, which bears a memento from Canada, these men are executing what they were trained for, protect the weaponry and the fleet. But the next order will be more difficult. Would he join a Russian Navy? 
I'm not the kind of officer who could take an oath twice, he says. There's a thin veneer of bravado from the lieutenant commander. You can see my smile. Everything okay. It won't be. In the near future, the choices will be surrender or quit or leave Crimea. Susan Ormiston, CBC News on the Crimean Peninsula. Meanwhile, Foreign Affairs Minister John Baird says Canada won't be writing blank checks, but it is contributing $220 million to help stabilize Ukraine's finances. I believe all Canadians, including everyone in this House, are united in our commitment to a free, independent and democratic Ukraine. Baird says that money will be used to help restore the economic stability of Ukraine. He reiterated the fact the Canadian government will not recognize Sunday's referendum in Crimea, and he again condemned Russia's military actions in the region. Former New Democrat MP Olivia Chow has jumped into the race for Toronto mayor. The widow of former NDP leader Jack Layton made the announcement in the neighborhood where she grew up. We need a new mayor for a better city. And I am here to apply for the job. Chow touted her track record as a Toronto City Councillor and repeatedly made reference to her commitment to fiscal responsibility. Chow also took some shots at the current mayor, Rob Ford, and said it was time for change. Well, they're still stuck with most of last year's bumper crop, and the national rail companies have been ordered by the federal government to get the grain moving to port. But still, for many Western farmers, it's too little too late. They're past due on their loans, and they're now scrambling to find cash for this year. Bonnie Allen has more. Oh, the sight of grain cars finally rolling in. Farmers not far behind. They're eager to get their crop to the elevator and onto that train so they can get a paycheck. It's been almost four months. It's been four months since I've hauled, yeah. So how do you feel today then? I'm actually kind of happy. Whether it's the warmer temperatures or due to pressure from Ottawa, the rail companies seem to be ramping up service. At one elevator, desperate farmers lined up for hours to unload their grain. As more grain cars begin to roll, more farmers will receive some payment. But it's too late for many who are past due on their loans. And it's not enough for those who don't have enough cash to see this year's crop. It's a billion dollar problem. The federal government has a program that loans farmers money with interest if they have grain stuck in their bins. So far, 12,500 farmers have applied this year. That's a 25% increase. And they've collected $1.6 billion so far, up a half billion dollars over last year. After all, don't be fooled by this snow. Seeding time is less than two months away. By now, farmers have usually bought seed and fertilizer. If you don't have money, you simply don't go out and buy stuff. Um, and that's the case here. Jim Edder runs a seed processing plant. His orders are down by half. Customers don't have the storage space or money. That's the case for Jim Fink. He needs a few more trains to come in. I'll be able to pay my bills and I can sleep tonight. Like thousands of others, he'll have to borrow money to put this year's seed in the ground. Bonnie Allen, CBC News, Belgoni, Saskatchewan. Well, your ears may be too frozen or too covered in layers to hear this, but this is an upside to this seemingly never-ending winter. It might just be the best year ever for ice cider. Never heard of ice cider? Well, think ice wine, but instead of grapes, it's made with apples. And like ice wine, Canada is a world-leading producer. Aaron Saltzman has more. Yes, those are snowshoes, and it's minus, who knows? And the wind is howling, and Thomas Wilson is freezing. He couldn't be happier. Great winter, uh, unfortunately, some people wouldn't agree with me, but, but a great winter for doing what we want to do. Wilson makes ice cider from apples that were left to freeze on the branch or from juice left outside in the cold until the water is frozen off. The liquid that remains is then fermented, and long stretches of cold weather make that liquid richer and more concentrated. It, through the freezing, especially the cold freezing, we've had you almost get a cooked flavor. It, it creates a bit of a caramel flavor to the juice. Ice cider tastes both sweet and tart. 
And no two batches are the same, says this cider writer. You'll find that each cider maker is an artist, a painter, as it were, using the fruit as their, as their paint and just painting the most unbelievable pictures with process and style. The individuality, the complexity, and of course the climate is why Canadian ice cider is prized around the world. As it is looked at as one of Canada's premier export products. It's still a niche offering. The top Canadian producer sells about 100,000 bottles a year. But that figure is growing by about 20% a year, despite being a relatively new product available mainly from the producers themselves. It's the type of popularity Thomas Wilson had been banking on. He bet big on the business selling the family farm to invest. The gamble now paying off, which is why the one thing you'll never hear from Wilson is a complaint about this weather. Well, this winter's been great. Aaron Saltzman, CBC News, near Caledon, Ontario. And a bit of an anniversary of some note. It was one year ago today that tens of thousands of people stood in anticipation in St. Peter's Square waiting to hear who would be the new Pope. And the name they heard came as a surprise to many. <laughs> Jose Maria Bergoglio was a cardinal from Argentina who would take the name Francis, becoming the first non-European Pope in more than 1,200 years. Francis has tried to bring a new openness to the church. He's urged it to care more about the underprivileged, and spend less time judging others. Let's take a look now at what happened on the markets today. In Toronto, the TSX dropped 73 points to 14,245. Dow plunged over 230 points to 16,108. The NASDAQ dropped over 60, closing at 42,60. The Canadian dollar gained a half cent, climbing to 90.47 cents US. Gold up slightly to $1,372 an ounce. Oil was also up a bit remaining in the $98 a barrel range.
Again, University of Thunder Wolves men's hockey team continue their preparations for that one big playoff game coming up this week at Ottawa. There is a potential problem on the horizon. Though. Yeah, not only could they be without their leading scorer, Mike Hammond, with that ankle injury, but their number one goalie, uh, he tried to play last weekend, came back, wasn't in fine form. So just how healthy is he? That's the big question. And, and as we mentioned, there are questions concerning Jeff Bosch's knee after Getting injured in the Wolves' second-round playoff series with Ryerson, he was pulled in both losses against Windsor last weekend, giving up a total of nine goals and only 41 shots. Even his coach is now wondering just how healthy his starting keeper is as the team prepares to take on Carleton in Ottawa Saturday night. Brian Bonazzo has more. Bill McDonald faces a goaltending dilemma. Start the veteran who was sensational through the first two rounds of the OUA playoffs, but who may or may not be 100% healthy, or play the rookie, who's maybe not as polished, but is at full strength and is capable of holding his own. Jeff Bosch clearly played below his usual standard against Windsor and is no lock to start this Saturday. I'm the type of guy, I see what I see, and everybody's seen it. He probably, you know, had, had a couple of guys had goals that he wanted back at a inopportune time, but uh, I'm going to monitor it uh, as the week goes. Uh, there was a couple times where I thought he was a little slow getting up. Bosch injured his left knee in the second game of the Ryerson series. He admits in hindsight, he maybe wasn't as ready to play against Windsor as he initially thought. During the series, I thought uh, it was definitely something I could play through. Um, maybe, maybe it wasn't, maybe it was, I, I don't know, but uh, uh, it might have definitely affected my play a little bit for sure. And, uh, you know, didn't feel... Uh, you know, I didn't feel near as good as I did in the first two series, that's for sure. Bosch will continue to be evaluated in the days leading up to Saturday's clash with Carlton. Whether it's he or rookie Justin McDonald between the pipes, teammates insist it doesn't matter. They have full confidence in both goalies. Captain Andrew Wilkins says it's up to the rest of the team to play better in front of whoever's in net. We were a little bit too passive. We were worrying about uh, more stick on puck opposed to getting on the body right away, taking away time and space. So, again, that's going to be huge playing on the road, and we need to make it hard for those guys. Ryan Bonazzo, TBT Sports. At the OHL Cup in Toronto, the Thunder Bay Minor Midget Kings were clipped 2-1 this morning by Whitby. Alex Matichik scored his second goal of the tournament for the Kings, who dropped a 1-2, and, and they've got to win their final round-robin game tomorrow morning against Vaughn to have any shot at making the playoffs. NHL tonight, seven games, including the Leafs in L.A., Minnesota welcomes the Rangers, and Edmonton tries to avoid the season sweep in St. Louis. Last night in Winnipeg, late in the second, Vancouver will tie it at one off the faceoff. Alex Burroughs goes to the net, ducks in the rebound. It's his first goal of the season. He led the Canucks with 36 last year. Scary moment for the Canucks. Ryan Kessler left with a leg injury after getting hit by the Jets. Jim Slater early, third Ole Jokinen with the great pass to his streaking Michael Froelich. The X-Hawk flips in his 13th, Winnipeg back in front 2-1. Tied at 2, this one decided in a shootout. Former half Chris Higgins bears down on Andre Pavlik. Nice little forehand uh, there to give Vancouver the 3-2 win. Their first road win in 8. In Montreal, visiting Bruins over the scoring of a Canadian's turnover. Carl Soderberg ends a long drought with his 11th. Boston beats the Habs 4-1. Uh, in Calgary, Flames captain Mark Giordano wires up by Ducks goalie Jonas Hiller as they go on to hammer Anaheim 7-2. And Colorado edged Chicago 3-2. One well, new details over the death of 20-year-old Saginaw Spirit forward Terry Trafford, whose body was found in his truck in Michigan Tuesday night. Sean O'Shea has more. Terry Trafford was just 20 years old. The North York athlete playing for the Saginaw Spirit of the Ontario Hockey League was found dead inside his truck in Michigan last night. He'd been missing since March the 3rd. Now it turns out he suffered from depression. Some teammates say he threatened to kill himself. The rough and tumble of trying to make it in hockey isn't easy for young athletes at a high level. Sometimes we see them going to some very negative behaviors like drinking and engaging in more of those addictive types of behaviors to satisfy and sustain them so that they can do their sport. The pressure to succeed on the ice can be measured shift by shift and some players can deal with that pressure a lot better than others. Some of the guys they just they can't deal with it as well. I don't know when they're under pressure you, you don't play as well not to the best of your game. The possibility of an NHL career or a hockey scholarship looms for many. These major junior players are competing in the OHL Cup. Joseph Murdaka is a goalie and after he's had a bad game it's not always easy. I get down to myself um, 
Uh, it's not, I, I'll take it out on other people. Yeah, outside it's worse. Depression can stalk athletes. Derek Bogart played for the New York Rangers. Rick Rickman played for the Vancouver Canucks. Wade Belak for the Toronto Maple Leafs. All three NHL athletes took their own lives. The pressure to perform is there from a young age. Margaret McDonald is a hockey parent. She manages the Mississauga Senators. For kids to get to this level, they have um, they have inherent uh, um, uh, desire to succeed, desire to do well. She says, though, pressure is not usually driven by parents. I think you can see that the kids whose parents have been putting a lot of pressure on them may not be the ones that are doing as well now. Terry Trafford had just been suspended from his Saginaw team for smoking pot, a public demotion that athletes have to cope with all the time. Where you and I have our successes in private, they have their successes and their failures for the whole world to see, particularly the more represented and elite that they are. Sean O'Shea, Global News. The Toronto Raptors opened a three-game homestand of the hangar last night against the Detroit Pistons team that had lost seven of their last nine. The Raps race out to a 12-point lead. It will be DeMar DeRozan taking the long way home to the hoop. He had 12 first-half points. Amir Johnson shows he's more than an inside force, knocking down the jumper. You could give him 11 first-half points, drawn by seven at the break. Double D then beats his man off the dribble, using the window to lay it up and in. And now, the dunk of the game. It went to the Pistons' Josh Smith for this two-handed slam, but it's all Toronto in this one. DeRozan knifes his way through traffic for the layup. He had a game-high 25 points as they blow it open in the fourth. Point guard Kyle Lowry chipped in with 19, hitting from Young Street. And how about the hard-working Amir hitting the 20-point plateau with the throwdown. Raps win 101-87, improving to 36 and 27. NFL News Denver receiver Eric Decker is leaving for the New York Jets. He'll make about $36 million over the next five years. Philadelphia has acquired running back Darren Sproles from New Orleans for a fifth rounder. New England inked cornerback Darrell Revis to a two-year contract. And what's believed to be the world's oldest hockey stick could be yours this weekend for the right price. What better setting than an outdoor hockey game for a history lesson on our national pastime? This is it here, guys. Oh. That's the world's oldest hockey stick. It's a Nova Scotia stick. Oh, that's sick. A stick made around 1835, hand carved from a sugar maple tree in Cape Breton. It's age verified by tree dating experts at Mount Allison University. So it's so old it predates hockey. In a sense it does, but it was witness to its evolution, which is amazing because it was used in the Moffat family from about 1835 through about 1885. Presley picked it up for $1,000 after seeing it on the wall of this barber shop six years ago. After toying with the idea of selling it, he's gone one step further, putting it up for auction on eBay to finance his return to university. I really have no idea where it'll end up in terms of a figure, because I don't know that you can necessarily put one on this particular object. Presley does have a figure in mind, and although bids are 50 times more than what he paid, they're still below his secret minimum number. If his price isn't met, he'll keep the Moffat stick, which he says evokes the Canadian experience before there was a Canada. Well, what was it like then when there wasn't radio, when there wasn't television, when you worked hard and you hoped for the day that you had a little time to yourself so you could play hard too? An emotional grip that's not easy to shake. I just like the idea that the last time this stick was used was about over 100 years ago. This stick was used for about 40 years. So imagine a stick lasting 40 years. Ours are made in a factory now. 200 bucks. Oh. Yeah, 200 bucks. What do you think something like this might be worth? A lot. Yeah, a lot. It's really old too, it's really neat. The bidding closes Saturday as he stick handles the sale of a Canadian treasure. <laughs> there we go. Lost Lord Global News, Kentville, Nova Scotia. Yeah, I don't know about that guy. If I owned that stick, I'd be keeping it away from the neighborhood kids. Yeah, I'll go on the ice playing with it. I mean, I'm sitting here wondering, what happens if you just snap the blade? Yep. There goes the auction. Right? <laughs> That's for sure. All right, thanks very much, Randy. All right, on tonight uh, on Global Thunder Bay, we have comedy and drama with your full viewing lineup. Here's Teletalk. Tonight on Global Thunder Bay, starting at 8 on Growing Up Fisher, everyone's decided to start dating again. At 8.30 on The Millers, Nathan can't decide who to take to a dinner with the president. Then at 9 on Parenthood, Jasmine and Crosby disagree over a crucial point in Ada's upbringing. And at 10 on Elementary, Holmes investigates when a cancer researcher is found murdered. 
over on CKPR Thunder Bay at 8, The Nature of Things has Canada like you've never seen it. Then at 9 on a season like no other, it's a pre-cup matchup between the Ducks and the Penguins. And at 11.35, we've got your highlights of the day from the Sochi Paralympics. Teletalk is brought to you by Points, the traffic ticket specialists. Well, a relatively cloudy day today, Kasha, and I hear that there is also some snow on the way. I know. Nothing says spring like more snow headed for us. <laughs> <laughs> and it's coming for us tonight and tomorrow. We saw a peak of it this morning. Uh, not much. A few flurries around 7 and 9 this morning, but mostly cloudy, like you said, throughout the day. We saw peaks of sunshine, giving us a high of minus 1, and a wind chill of minus 16. As the day progressed, it was more so minus 7, and some pretty moderate winds. Uh, they had some good conditions across the country. On the west coast, Vancouver has some clouds right now, plus 8, and a bit colder in Prince George with some sun and cloud at plus 5. Edmonton and Calgary, similar temperature, and uh, just some sun and cloud for them throughout the day. Saskatoon is at plus 2, Regina just below that with some cloudy skies, and Winnipeg had a mix of sun and clouds throughout the day and temperature of plus 3, and Churchill much colder at minus 22. As we look in southern Ontario, uh, Toronto had minus 8. Pretty decent conditions for them. They had a nasty day yesterday, so they're still dealing with that today. Uh, just clouds for them so far, and Ottawa minus 8. And the southern part of Quebec, they actually have a snowstorm warning in effect. They're going to get about 15 to 30 centimetres of snow. Plus, uh, they're going to have pretty high winds, so it's going to be bad visibility for their region. And even messier conditions over in the Maritimes. Um, there's a flash freeze in effect for Nova Scotia. 
they're gonna, their temperatures are uh, going to drop rapidly from above zero to well below zero. So any water on the roads or on the walkways is immediately going to turn to ice, so it's going to be dangerous for them. Uh, Fredericton at minus 10, so precipitation for them right now. Shawatin just a bit warmer than that at minus 8. And St. John's um, at plus 8. Uh, for the province of Newfoundland, the northern half is going to get uh, some heavy snow, about 15 to 20 centimeters, and the southern part of the province is actually going to get some rain. So they have a rainfall warning in effect, getting 15 to 22 to 25, sorry, millimeters of rain. Looking at the systems in a region, you can see that low-pressure system that hovered over us, bringing lots of precipitation uh, well into tomorrow, like I said, and a cold front is following and dropping our temperatures into Saturday. So the precipitation will leave us by then. But that uh, low front is affecting the whole region, bringing precipitation. Most of the area is um, above minus 10, which is good to hear. Uh, minus 9 in Sioux Lookout. Some precipitation already started right there. Uh, minus 13 in Red Lake and further south, uh, along closer to the water, Atacokan minus 4. And the precipitation again, has started again for Greenstone. They had it earlier today. And it'll start again tonight, uh, minus 8. And Sault Ste. Marie at minus 6 tonight. And we'll continue into tomorrow uh, with cloudy skies, plus one, minus six in Greenstone. And over to the west, uh, Dryden's going to have minus five, Kenora minus six, and further south, some uh, precipitation as well for Atacokan. If you're heading out this hour, we're at the freezing mark, so it's even warmer than our daytime high we had today. With a wind chill of just minus seven, the road should be pretty clear right now. The sun uh, dried up most of the, the roads for us, some icy areas. Uh, cloudy right now, and uh, winds gusting up to 19 kilometers an hour. And for tonight, that's when that low pressure system is headed right for us, giving us those, that snowfall. Wind chill of minus 13, a low of minus 3, and that temperature is going to stay steady throughout the night. And uh, winds gusting up to 41 kilometers an hour. Uh, let's look at the extended forecast. Over the next couple of days, tomorrow we're going to get another 2 centimeters uh, on the freezing mark, so pretty warm temperature and only a, a low of minus 17. And Saturday, with that cold front coming for us, temperatures will drop quite a bit with a high of minus 10 and a low of minus 25. So it's going to be really cold on Saturday. Slowly going to creep a bit warmer on Sunday, mostly sunny throughout the day with a high of minus 7 and a low of minus 17. And then Monday, we could start seeing flurries again uh, from Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday. A very low chance, though. Um, warmer temperatures with minus 2 and uh, a low of minus 9. And then Tuesday, mainly cloudy, uh, more to the seasonal temperatures with minus 1 and minus 10. So you can see over the past week, we've had a mix of ups and downs, warm and cold. And now that trend is going to continue for us well into next week, as you can see. So I guess we've got to take each day as it comes, hope for the best, and keep hoping that spring will come soon. Let's head now to the Thunder Bay Humane Society, where tonight Fiona Gardner is with Newman, a nine-year-old Husky Cross. Hi, this week's Humane Society Pet of the Week is Newman, who is a nine-year-old Husky Cross. Now we don't know a lot about Newman. Newman was a transfer from Dryden. So what we can tell so far is that he's very sweet, he's very gentle, and he's actually quite good on a leash. But this boy at nine years of age, well, it's a little hard for him to find a home. So they've made it easier through a donation from the community. His adoption fee has been waived. So if you could find it in your heart to give this beautiful boy a soft landing in his final years, come to the Humane Society and meet Newman today. Your Pet of the Week has been brought to you by Thunder Pet. Expert advice and high quality pet food within your budget. Well, it's a body of water that's not too inviting for most, but some absolutely spectacular underwater pictures are emerging from there. I love that for you right after these words.
How would you feel about jumping into a lake full of jellyfish? That's just what photographer Nadia Ali did, and she's getting a whole lot of attention for her latest work. Images of, aptly named, Jellyfish Lake, a place few humans have ever ventured. Yes, there may have been a few stings along the way, but her pictures are absolutely astounding. There's even a selfie in there that I think you saw a second or two ago. He spent eight hours in the water snapping thousands of these images. There's one more number for you to consider. That lake has an estimated 10 million jellyfish. Glad she was the one swimming in there. The pictures are spectacular, <laughs> aren't they? Yeah, but I thought jellyfish sting you, so... Yeah, well, they do. That's when... why no one goes there. <laughs> <laughs> We're going to recap our top story. Well, we now know what caused that smell that hovered over the city. It turns out that Resolute Pulp and Paper Mill had an equipment malfunction, which led to the discharge of thick gases this morning. And coming up later, hockey, hockey, and more hockey. Thunderwolves <laughs> uh, will have the latest as they prepare to try and get into the CIS play-in game as they hit the road in Ottawa to meet Carleton, and there are seven NHL games we'll take you around the rings. And prepare for a messy drive tomorrow. We've got snow tonight, tomorrow, and a possibility of freezing rain, but we will have a daytime high of zero, so there's the silver lining. Such as it is. That'll do it for tonight's look at news, weather, and sports. Thank you all for being with us. We'll see you again tomorrow.